the Books Library series. Today we are fortunate to have with us a learned scholar from Sorbonne University, Paris, and uh, you will be surprised to know that he is working on Persian manuscripts, Persian poetry. He will be speaking on Indo-Persian poetry in the 17th century with a special reference to poem of Aqil Khan Razi, Masnavi Mehruma, and Zebunisa. The students of history must be aware with the name of Aqil Khan Razi, Zebunisa, and uh, his poem, Masnavi Mehruma. As you are aware, Kudabush Library is a treasure house of uh, rare manuscripts in Persian, especially in history and poetry. A number of scholars have been visiting the library for their researches to consult these manuscripts. So today he is here to work on his research project and on my request uh, he agreed to deliver a lecture on the subject so that uh, we all may also know about uh, uh, his subject and his topic, what he has been uh, writing, what he has been thinking. Our library is there to help him in all possible ways when we talk about the scholarly help. And organizing such lectures is a very uh, simple way for the dissemination of knowledge. So we will be able to listen to a scholar who has studied for several years about this subject. I welcome the scholar, Mr. Victor Baptist, to kindly come and deliver his talk on this subject. Most welcome, Mr. Victor. Please come. Thank you, Madam, for your presentation. I am very happy to be here at the Huda Bush Library. I feel very honored. Um, when coming here, I did not think of delivering any lectures, so it is uh, a little bit improvised, but I am very happy to share my work with you and uh, to be here in Patna today. I feel very honored. Thank you. So, um, indeed, I, I work um, for my PhD on Indo-Persian poetry, uh, especially during the 17th century, and um, I work on an author called Akil Khan Razi, who lived uh, throughout all the 17th century, um, from 1614 to 1696. So um, he lived a very long life, and um, his life is very interesting, and so is his work. So uh, Persian poetry, uh, poetry in Farsi, um, has a very long history. Um, of course, it originated in Iran, what we know today as Iran, but spread throughout um, a great part of Asia, like Central Asia, uh, what we call today uh, Afghanistan or Tajikistan. Um, it is countries in which uh, people still speak Farsi and practice poetry in Farsi. And Persian also spread to um, India um, during uh, first the 13th century and uh, was cultivated in many different courts and dynasties in the Indian subcontinent. So, um, when we speak of Indo-Persian poetry, uh, we mean uh, the poetry that uh, was uh, composed in Farsi, uh, but uh, that was composed in Farsi in India. So, it is as simple as, as that. It is um, the special type of poetry composed in India in the Farsi, the Persian language. So the period I work on, the 17th century, is 
uh, of course, the period of the Mughal Empire, the, the Mughal Sultanate. And in the 17th century, we have three uh, main reigns. So, first the reign of Jahangir, uh, very important, then uh, Shah Jahan, of course, and finally a very long reign of um, Aurangzeb Alamgir. So, um, uh, Farsi poetry as cultivated in India, in Hindustan, as they called it in that stage, is closely linked to poetry in Iran, um, even during the 17th century, because uh, many poets at this stage migrated um, Iran, say, Hindustan, Turk, and it was what they called at that time uh, Sefer Sazi. So, Sefer Sazi was what poet would do because in India the, the opportunities and the level of wealth was much higher. Coming to India, you had uh, higher chances of having a job and being able to practice your specialty like uh, shairi, uh, architecture, nakashi, painting, etc. So, Iran, so at that at that stage, India was uh, a very attractive place for a lot of people, and um, as a result, um, many different poets came. Um, Iran se Hindustan Turk, uh, Misal Tarpe Urfi Shirazi, uh, 16th century, a very important poet, uh, or also uh, Saeb Tabrezi, uh, 17th century, and some of these poets. Um, created a new style of poetry. They actually, at first, they imitated an Iranian poet called uh, Baba Firani, a very important poet uh, during the 15th and 16th century. And um, getting uh, from Baba Firani some inspiration, they started to write in a new style that we called in Persian Terzitaza. Um, so the, the new style, uh, also called uh, Taza Goftar, or sometimes Taza Gori. And all these names are actually designation for a style in which imagination, uh, was very important, and um, in which poets cultivated what they called Pechi de Gui Khayal, meaning very complicated thoughts articulated together, uh, imagination, uh, interlinked, and they loved that a lot, and what they actually were seeking was some sort of newness in poetry, meaning tazegi, something new, something fresh. So this is the case mainly in the Rezel poetry, um, and for a certain number of poets, like of course Orfi, uh, Saib, Kalim Kashani, and many others, many also lesser known poets like Nasir Ali Sirhindi. Uh, but this Taza Gui, Taza Guftar, was also important in the Musnavi form. Um, the first one, perhaps, in India to cultivate this form, at least one of the most important ones. Uh, was Faizi ibn Mubarak uh, during the reign of Akbar, so he's a little bit earlier, not 17th century, but 16th century, but he's very important because uh, many poets during the 17th century got inspiration from Faizi. Uh, he used a very intricate and complicated style uh, with a lot of images, the uh, Savir, a lot of different um, subjects, uh, what we call uh, Mazamin, Mazamin put together and uh, mixed, and um, he composed a Masnavi called Nal Daman. The subject of the Masnavi is the study of Nal and Damayanti from the Mahabharat, and this is very important because in that Masnavi, um, his main subject was an Indian subject. And this is important as far as the um, poetry during the 17th century is concerned, because in that Masnavi, Matlab Nal Daman Me, 
the imagery, the, the terriul of the poem was very inspirational for later poets. Um, for example, Faizi described India as a particularly warm place, and he created an imagery of uh, fire and burning, artish or souls, that is very linked to India because, as he explains, in India the climate, uh, mosum or eklim, as they call it in Persian, is very uh, warm, garm, and very also burning, sozanda. And this imagery of fire is linked to the burning of love in the poetry, soz ishk in Persian. And this theme, this theme is very important because um, Akhil Khan Razi, the author I work on, got inspiration from this sort of imagination, Tukhayul, Tasavir, and all that. Um, as a result, he wrote a number of texts very close to what Faizi had done, and a number of poets did that during the 17th century. Matlab, shairi me rivayat ko ishara karte hai. Ek rivayat, ek khas rivayat bante hai Hindustan ke liye. And this is very important. And so, uh, to be more precise about Akhil Khan Razi, um, his life uh, spanned during the reign of uh, Emperor Aurangzeb, mainly. Um, he grew up, uh, perhaps he was born in Iran, we don't know. Perhaps he, migrate, he migrated to India later on in his life, we are not sure. What is sure is that in his youth, she was uh, living in the city of Burhanpur, uh, today in Madhya Pradesh, uh, in the south of Madhya Pradesh. And she was um, a disciple of the Sufi Sheikh Burhanuddin Shatari, uh, known uh, in title Munkhatib as Raz Ilahi also. And um, she was part of the Darbar of Aurangzeb, Prince Aurangzeb at the time. Um, in the 1650s, Akhil Khan composed two Masnavis. The first one is known as Mehroma. It is a translation, a Tajuma in Persian, from Hindi in Farsi of um, a text in Hindi called Madhuma Alati. And this text was written by uh, the poet Manjan in 1545, and Akhil Khan translated it one century later. She also translated another work in Hindi or Hindavi, as they call it in Persian, um, that, that is called Shamu Parvana. It is a translation, Tarjuma once again, of Padmavat, uh, written by Malik Muhammad Jayasi in 1540. What is interesting is that these Tarjume are not literal translation. It's not literal, it is more like an adaptation. Sometimes um, the story is changed and a number of things are adapted to the Farsi and the Biyat. What is too much Desi, Deshi, or too much Hindi is adapted. For example, um, in uh, Madhumalati, in a moment in the story, some fairies arrive in a room, and the fairy's name in Hindi is Achara, like Apsaras in Sanskrit. And this was translated by Akhil Khan by the word Pari. So it also means fairies, but in a Persian context. Farsi siyako sabakne, Pari hojatihe. So some things like that were a little bit changed in the Farsi version. Um, so, what is interesting is that Akhil Khan was not alone doing translation, but he was part of a tradition, a rivayat that existed at that time. And a number of authors also translated in Persian uh, works such as Padmavet. An example of that is Bazmi, a poet, an earlier poet, who translated Padmavet under the name uh, Ritpadam. Also another poet um, was called Rai Govin Munshi, and he translated in prose uh, Nasr uh, Padmavad under the title Tufetukulu. 
So it is very interesting to see that at that time it was there was a fashion around these Hindavi stories, and many Farsi poets translated them in their language. So, um, what about the social context, the, the so to say, uh, Samaji context of all these tarjume in the 17th century? Usually, we have a patron, somebody who pays for the, the poetry, for the shairi or the masnavi, and it can be a pacha or it can be a mansabdar, somebody who has a position in the court. Uh, and then we have the poet, and in many um, instances, it is a derbari shair, a courtly poet. So it was the case of Akhil Khan Razi, and um, we can see that because he wrote a lot of works in his life, including a history of the war of succession between Shah Jahan's son, sons, and in which uh, Aurangzeb, uh, in the end, became victorious and became the, uh, the emperor. So, uh, Akhil Khan, after the crowning of Aurangzeb, when Aurangzeb became Pacha Alamgir and ascended to the throne, um, Akhil Khan got a mansab, a position, and he got a number of different mansab in his life. And, uh, for example, at first he was in Avad, in the Dohab, then he was in Lahore, and then um, he came back to Delhi, and he became Daroha i Ghusl Khana. So it is only to give an example, this Daroha i Ghusl Khana is in fact the people in charge of the Ghusl Khana of the Pacha. But it is a very important position because the Daroha um, can hear every secret meeting. He is very close to the, the emperor. Um, so this was in fact a very important position. And, um, at the end of his life, Akhil Khan had an even uh, higher position because he became the Qiladar of Shah Jahanabad in Delhi. And uh, uh, in the Mughal Empire, and uh, he was already quite old. And at that time, um, some people say that he had a relation with Princess Zebun Nisa, who was Aurangzeb's daughter. And um, some myth came to be created about this relation between Akhil Khan and Zebun Nisa, and some people pretended later on that it was a love relationship, that they had an affair. But uh, if we look at the sources, the historical sources, there is nothing to support this claim. It is probably not true. Um, what is sure is that Zebun Nisa was herself a very important shair, a very important poet, and she wrote uh, under the Tukhulus, so, so pen name, um, Murphy, so the hidden one, out of modesty. Um, what is uh, certain is that Zebun Nisa was later jailed, and some people pretended that it was because of her relation with Akhil Khan. In fact, in the true history, it was because Zebun Nisa supported her brother, uh, Prince Mohammed Akbar, who rebelled against Aurangzeb. So Aurangzeb was infuriated and he ordered Zebun Nisa to be put um, in seclusion, in jail, in the fort of Selinger. So this is the true, the true story about it. And um, uh, what we can also say about this social context is that Akhil Khan, um, as we can see, had a lot of relations with the Darbar, but he also had relations with young poets, such as uh, the very young uh, Abdul Qadir Beydil Dehlavi, who came to be known uh, as the, one of the main poets of this Taza Guftar that we spoke about, and he supported it when uh, he supported him when he was still very young and uh, helped him a lot. So, um, as a conclusion, we can see that during the 17th century, um, Indo-Persian poets inherited from the 16th century, from the period of uh, uh, Akbar Pacha, 
and developed what we now call the Indian style. So this is known as Sabki Hindi in Farsi, and at that time it was known as this Taza Buftar, Taza Goi. In this um, school of poetry, the practice of translation, tarjuma, and adaptation was common. And um, especially from the vernacular languages, what they called bhaka or bhasha, Hindavi or Hindi, and was a source of inspiration for all the, the Farsi shair that existed during this period. Akhil Khan is perhaps not the best representation of the Taza Muftar, but still he was very much included in his contemporary uh, Muasir, as they say in, in, in Persian setting, with connection to the Darbar of Pasha Aurangzeb and also to promising poets such as Abdul Qadir Bedil Dehlavi. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, welcome questions, if uh, any, uh, on history, culture, poetry, uh, related to the subject. Myself, Krishan Kumar, as a scholar, I want to know something about uh, how I know about the what about uh, what is the uh, proof and uh, if, if any proof is available for the Ramayan or whether Mahabharat in the history because everyone matlab, everyone want to know is there Hinduism really Hinduism exist earliest or not kindly we point uh, the question is ambiguous or clear kar dijiye hindustani mein bhi bol dijiye <laughs> Actually, I wanted to know that the Hinduism is the same as Ramayan and Mahabharat. So, in the Ramayan and Mahabharat, the evidence is only Mahabharat. But the Ramayan is not the same as the Ramayan. Inside, I will go. Inside, I will not get the evidence of Ramayan. But the Mahabharat is the same as the Mahabharat. तो क्या मैं मान सकता हूँ कि रामायण जो है एग्जिस्ट हुआ है नहीं है या तो फिर ये फिर मतलब बस एक स्टोरी की तरह ड्रिल किया जा रहा है और उसको मतलब उसको बोल के मतलब आगे बढ़ाया जा रहा है बस हम तो हिंदी में ही बोलेंगे पर्शियन कल्चर और हड़प्पा और मोहन जोधड़ो में क्या अंतर था जैसे कि दोनों के रिलेशन में कोई विशेष अंतर है या नहीं Hinduism and uh, Persians religion, some different between. मेरा नाम किशन तिवारी हैं. इनके subject से connected कोई question करना चाहे तो? जो Persian culture है और Hinduism के जो culture हैं दोनों में क्या different हैं तो आप सब अपने से हिसाब से PhD scholar के हिसाब से बताइएगा please. Okay, thank you. आइए कोई नहीं है, no questions? आइए please. Sir, I want the basic thing. I hear lot of scholars. They are face lot of problems, challenges faces. They are during the searching times. And how beginner are aware the real fact and the you know lots of thing are created false. We don't know, the beginner don't know, but the scholar who research this matter, they are know well. So I want this experience. Once more, please explain. In Hindi? Ah, yes. Okay. Actually, sir, I want to know this. I have heard many scholars. They face problems. So what type of problems they face? Problem face karte hai. To kis type ko problem face karte hai? और जैसे कि बहुत सारे चैलेंजेस मतलब फेस करना रहता है पुरानी चीज को कलेक्ट करके अलग अलग चीज और बहुत सारे चीज जो है जो मतलब पास्ट में लिखा हुआ रहता है लेकिन प्रेजेंट में उसको मॉडिफाइड करके नया कर देता है तो हम लोग जो पास्ट का चीज रहता है उससे हम लोग अवेयर नहीं हो पाते हम लोग नया पे ही ब्लिप करते हैं तो जो बिगिनर्स होते हैं उसको तो पता नहीं रहता कि पास्ट में क्या चीज़ रहता है स्टार्टिंग में जो लर्नर्स प्रेजेंट में है उसको भी ये नहीं पता रहता दोनों में डिफरेंसेस क्या है तो जो प्रेजेंट रहता है हम लोग उसी को मान लेते हैं तो उसके लिए ये बहुत बड़ा चैलेंजेस है जो रियल चीज़ को वो कनेक्ट नहीं कर पाते तो मतलब आपका क्या एक्सपीरियंस है इस पर और इस चीज़ से हम लोग कैसे मतलब यू नो क्विक रिलीफ टाइप्स मेजर्स 
much later for me and um, but, but yes about the, the second question um, there is indeed a, a link between um, uh, Hinduism and, and the, the very ancient Persian religion because um, linguists claim that the, the languages uh, of North India and Iran are related so I believe that indeed there is uh, some common heritage in Hinduism and um, in the ancient Persian religion, I mean uh, before Islam, but uh, then again it is a very difficult subject um, and, and I must say that I don't know many things about it. Um, I believe there is also a lot of research uh, that has been done um, in India and in many places about that, so yes, they, they, they would know a lot more than I do. I mean. Um, I work on the 17th century, so it's very much later, and um, it's much closer to our world. And um, so yes, I, I'm sorry, I am not able to answer uh, very precisely to these matters, but I know that some informations are available, and a lot of works uh, has been done on this field. So so hopefully, you will you will be able to find some some answer. Um, well, uh, about the, the, the two uh, last questions about uh, the, the sources and how, how to research and, and I mean I think these questions are both uh, related together and um, indeed it's very difficult to uh, sort of fact check everything when it is uh, old enough. I mean even the 17th century it is very difficult and uh, I think that uh, everybody needs to be very cautious uh, about this, this story <coughs> between Akil Khan and Zebun Nisa. Well, it, you know, we must be very cautious. I mean, nobody knows what happened really. It is almost impossible to say because um, we have some first-hand sources. So first-hand sources are the sources written during that period by people who saw the events and saw what happened. So it helps, but the issue is that sometimes people do not write everything because they can be afraid, they might want to hide something, and it is very difficult. You have to assess every source uh, according to the agenda that the, that the person who wrote the source was following. I mean, what was his intentions and all that. So it is a way to assess a source. And um, yes, I mean, according uh, not only to my opinion, but to the opinion of uh, other scholars, we have no contemporary sources speaking about a love affair between Akhir Khan and Zebu, uh, in Zebu Nisa. So it's very later sources and hearsay. So, Perhaps it was the case, perhaps something happened, but um, we cannot prove it. And without proof, we must be very careful and um, re-examine everything. So 
who knows, maybe someday a new source, uh, a letter, a book will appear and give us some information. But for the time being, we, we have to, to be careful, I suppose. And um, yes, uh, it can be frustrating, but I suppose that it is uh, part of the job sometimes. Thank you very much. Discussions open new doors also. So you have listened, uh, Mr. Victor. Somebody asked about uh, um, depending on the secondary sources. Uh, one has to uh, go through the original sources to know the fact. Especially when it comes to medieval Indian history, uh, we have to see the original sources written in Persian. So the students uh, and uh, future scholars of medieval Indian history need to learn uh, Persian language so that uh, they, may, um, uh, they may know the facts. And the facts are available in original sources which are uh, mostly in Persian language. This was the old language. The uh, library. Our library is rich enough to uh, possess a large number of manuscripts, Persian manuscripts especially, on medieval Indian history. There are some um, more than 4,000 uh, uh, manuscripts in Persian. And uh, um, on, on Akhil Khan Razi, we have uh, uh, a number of works of Akhil Khan Razi on him and by him. A good literature is available on uh, Zebunisa also. Recently, Kudamash Library has published a, a book, a brief um, book, short book on Zebunisa by the learned scholar of his times, Professor um, S.H.S. Kari. You can uh, see the book, it is available uh, in the library, available in the showcase also. And uh, it is also available in our publication division for the scholars uh, who want to uh, purchase the book. And one more thing, uh, somebody was asking about uh, Ramayana and uh, Mahabharat. Kisne liki, kab liki, ho, kahan se aaya, kya sachai, kya hai, myth hai, kya mythological hai, and whatever, so many questions. So I just want to say that, ye nahi dekhna chahiye, ke achhi baat koon keh raha hai, hai? koon keh raha hai, kahan se aai, ya uske root kya hai, अगर वो अच्छी बात है तो we should imbibe it उसको हमें pick up कर लेना चाहिए चाहे वो रामायण में हो या भारत में हो if it is in Bible or in Quran or in any other holy scripture तो उसमें जो भी ऐसी values की बातें हैं values inculcated की गई हैं and which are teaching a way to lead best life शराफ़ से जीने का तरीका और सलीका अगर कोई होली स्क्रिप्चर्स बताते हैं तो हमें उसको लेते चलना चाहिए इस बात को सोचे बगैर कि उसकी हकीकत क्या है किसने लिखी कब आई और कौन कहाँ से और ऑल दिस थिंग्स ये तो सिंस लॉन्ग वी हैव बीन स्टडीइंग दिस होली स्क्रिप्चर्स और उसने यही वैल्यूज बताई गई हैं कि हम लोग जितने भी मसाब हैं हिंदुस्तान के क्या कहिए दुनिया भर के उनमें ज़्यादातर यही बातें आई हैं दोहराई गई हैं बार बार कि one should lead a life life of I mean full of values ethical life जीने को बताया गया है अगर वो fully नहीं तो fifty percent भी उसको अगर हम लोग उसमें से ये values लेते चलें तो हमारी आपकी सबकी lives में बहुत सुकून, खुशियाँ और peace शामिल हो सकता है and that is sure to lead a to a healthy society जब एक बात को इस बात को हम लोग समझ जाते हैं तो naturally ये society पे असर होता है society पे जब कोई ऐसा असर होता है तो पूरे देश में वो उसका असर नजर आता है। ये बातें थीं जो कुछ हमारे सामने आईं और आप सब का बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया कि आप यहाँ आए, आपने टाइम दिया और सुना और आई एम शुर कुछ ना कुछ यहाँ से आप ज्ञान की बातें लेके जाएंगे। थैंक यू सो मच मांस अगेन 
And thank you, uh, Mr. Lister. Thank you. Thank you very much.